Hello, everybody. We are so excited for today. We have been so expectant for the Lord to meet us in our services this morning and have just been asking him to meet us with his presence as we go into this new season. I was telling some people in between services that we feel so deeply honored and grateful that as we look out into this room, we see the faces of friends. And that is really rare in an experience like this. You know, usually a pastor is installed in the absence of one, and they're getting to know everybody for the first time. And of course, there are those of you that we have yet to meet, and we're excited to meet you. But for the most part, we feel folded in. This is our church. This is our home. This is our family. And so it's just a joy to be able to do this with all of you. And I just want to thank Omar and our district leadership, our council, our staff. Um, you, as a part of this community, you have all been praying and preparing for this new season. We're all a part of it. And I just feel like it's been stewarded so well and that there's been a grace on it and that we get to operate in that grace as we go into this next phase. And so, yes, it is a significant moment for us as a couple and individuals with individual callings and our family. But this is an important moment for our church I really believe that we're all a part of it and that there, we are entering into a new season and a new chapter. And that's not just semantics that suits what's happening here, but that's really what we are walking into. And so I hope you're expectant and I hope you're excited for what move of God and the new thing he's going to do in you. Because when we all step into something new together, that means he's got something new for you as well. Um, and I believe that this is a big moment for the kingdom and that the enemy needs to watch his back. Amen. If you brought your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew 22. Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. Reed and I have the privilege to share for a few moments each about what Jesus called the most important thing we could know. Matthew 22, 36 through 40. It says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. We were driving in the car last week and even anticipating these moments coming into this week, we were like, what do we say? You know, this is a big moment. No pressure, right? First message. Don't mess this up. What is the most important thing to say? Where do we begin? And personally, I was asking myself, too, will I be able to see through my mascara? Am I going to be able to say anything without a tremble in my voice? So far, so good. Like, we're hanging in there. And here's what we settled on, and this is what we heard from the Lord to share with you today. Love God and love people. What we want you to know, what we want the Lord to see as we step into this new assignment as your pastors, and as we all step into this new chapter, is that these commands from Jesus to love God and love people will guide everything we do. We will maintain a fidelity to and a passion for what Jesus most cares about, which is loving the Father and loving people with our whole lives. And it is our life's greatest honor and pursuit to see the Father, to know him, to adore him, to experience more of him. And it's our honor to give our lives to this community and to the lost so that many would know him, right? That's why we're all here. We got a revelation of his love. We saw him for who he is. It changed everything for us, and we want to see more added. And this is a calling that Reed and I have felt for over a decade. Like Omar shared, it's been this slow transformation, this slow process, this slow knowing and understanding from God, a vision that's burned in our hearts for a long time. And it's a dream come true to answer that call here at VIEW with all of you in a place that we love with people we love. But our yes to love God and love people goes beyond walking out a pastoral assignment. This is just our response as disciples. And it is a response, and these are commands that we are all called to walk in, that we can all walk in in power. Yep. Reed's going to share more about verses 39 through 40 as it connects to loving your neighbor, but I want to talk about the first commandment. He called it the first and the greatest, Jesus did, to love the Lord your God with all you have, your heart, your soul, your mind. It's important to know that Jesus was answering a question. So some religious leaders are looking to trap him. They're punks. 
and they want to reveal maybe some heresy, the thing that could finally condemn Jesus, some sort of betrayal of the law that they've all devoted their lives to. And so he, they ask him, hey, which is the greatest, just offhand? Maybe he'll mention the Sabbath or the one about, like, not stealing. Could Jesus accurately inform what is most important to the people of God? And so being Jesus, he doesn't miss a beat. And he says to them, the truest way to honor God is to love him. When we love God, it changes everything about us. It changes us from the inside out. When we put loving him at the center of our lives, what pours out is calling and purpose and purity and patience and joy and strength, perspective, peace, all the gifts and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Loving him makes us into who we were always meant to be. This is our calling. This is our purpose, to love him. You know, it's taken me a while to accept that my personal testimony isn't very exciting. It's not very flashy. I remember hearing incredible testimonies at camp or in youth group and being like, man, I wish that was my story. Now as a parent, I'm like, I'm glad that wasn't your story, girl. But I remember wishing that I had a little bit more to my story because the long and short of it is that I've loved the Lord since I was my daughter's age, five years old. And I've never been perfect, and I've experienced my fair share of pain, and every story matters. But at the end of the day, my life has been a response to his love. I love what it says in 1 John 4, 19. It tells us that a revelation of being loved unlocks inside of us a love for him. It says we love because he first loved us. So I didn't crack the code. I was simply introduced to the beautiful mystery that is God's love. My parents taught me about the love of God, and the more I've learned and experienced its true transforming power, the defining power it has, my only response could be to love him in return. When you encounter love, your only response is to love in return. And it doesn't mean it won't cost you. and It doesn't mean it won't change you. And it doesn't mean it won't be... It will, it'll be easy, but our response to his love, man, it's to love him in return because it's real love. And this is why it's so special to create moments for the next generation to get a taste of that love and be able to tell of it. You know, it's, they're, they're cute in their orange shirts and they're just singing a song, but there's more to it than that. Beneath it, it's that they've been in these classrooms over the last month or so learning about the love of God, that he is their firm foundation, and it's becoming a part of them. And so they get to tell that story, and we get to be a part of it. And our prayer is that they never walk away from that, that that love, the revelation of that love sticks with them forever. Amen? Amen? And so while my story with Jesus doesn't necessarily set up the most dynamic altar call you've ever heard, What I've learned over time and through plenty of stumbling is that when you make your life about loving the Lord, life becomes fulfilling. Truly, soul deep, to the core, fulfilling. Because loving God adds beauty and direction and protection, and it'll surprise you. It'll take you to places you didn't even know existed, like Clearview, for example, or Snohomish, a place we didn't even know was on the map three years ago but with hearts yielded to just follow and to love him completely, here we are. And the more you love, the more you trust. And the more you trust, the more you follow. And this is what we want to see for every person here. And I can say with every ounce of conviction in my heart that I have never regretted a single day loving him. And I have never regretted a single moment giving him my life. He always does better things with it than I ever could. And it's why I'm here, and it's how we're here. And it's my deepest prayer and my biggest dream for View Church that we would be known by how we love God, that we would be a house and a people whose love for God runs so big and is so deep and true and tangible that our lives would be changed because his love can change us, and there are deeper places his love has yet to take us. But also so that the people, oh, thank you for the water. Give it up for Tyler. got it our lives are changed by that love and there's more he wants to show us 
but also so that in our love for him and our devotion to him, people around us, in your schools, your next door neighbor, your family member, the person you work with, that they would start to see there's something going on on the inside of you. And it's nothing you conjured up. It's that you are loved and you know it. And when we live that way, people are compelled to wonder why, how? Because I've been searching for myself and I've been searching for meaning and purpose and a place in the world and I've been looking in all the wrong places. I've come up empty. But when we experience the real love of God and that love begins to pour out of us, people are compelled to ask us about it. That they would be found in it too. This is our prayer. This is our hope that people be found in his love and love him with everything. I'd love for a first-time guest to come through. Sure, tap to connect, get your coffee, drop your kids off. But wouldn't it be amazing if on the drive home every Sunday they would look at each other, they would think to themselves, man, that place, they love God. They love God. So let me encourage you, let me challenge you. Don't overcomplicate this. Love him. Just love him. Love him with all your heart. Love him with all your soul. Love him with all your mind. Keep no part of your life from loving him. It will change you. It will change your life. It is the greatest thing you will ever do. And it will always be what we prioritize as your pastors and as people. It will be our greatest pursuit that view will become a place that is known by their love for him. Hey, can we thank Pastor Victoria for that part of the message? So good. You know, building just a little bit off of what she said, I think there's a lot of things that can make a church great. You know, is it like, is it a cool building? Is the worship good? Do they take care of my kids well? But I think what really makes a church great and what we have come to love so much about this church is the people. Because the church is not the building. The church is us. And we have fallen in love with you guys. I'm like confessing my love to you up here. Like, yeah, I hope it's mutual. (laughs) We really love you guys. And um, since the very first day that we came here, you all have been so, you're like, it's my first day. But most of you, if you've been walking with us, you have been so accepting and loving and encouraging to us, and we felt like part of the family from day one. And so it's our hope, it's our prayer, it's what we are trying to keep going, is that we would continue to do that for others. That from the moment they step in here, they would know that they don't have to have all the answers, they don't have to have it all together, they can come in just as they are, and they can be loved on. And they can be pointed towards a God whose love is perfect. And that's our hope, and that's our prayer. And as I've been reflecting on this, I've just been thinking about how interesting it is to be a pastor. You know, we've been pastors for, like she said, over 10 years. Uh, This is our first time as lead pastors, but it's so interesting when I'm out making small talk. You know, maybe I'm standing in line for coffee or just, I don't know, if I'm traveling, I'm on a plane or something, and, you know, you're sitting next to that person, and you're just kind of chatting, they go, so what do you do? And I have that moment. You know, I've always thought about, like, how could I be like, well, I work for an ancient nonprofit that is about, like, restoration and healing, and we build schools, and we, like, all this stuff. I always end up just saying, I'm a pastor. I get one of two responses. Some some people are like, that's amazing. This is the church I go to, or this is uh, the part of the community I'm about, or I love Jesus so much, that's so great. How did you become a pastor? Or the other response that, unfortunately, I get more often is people go, oh. <laughs> and that's kind of the end of that conversation, because they're like, I don't know if they think I'm like going to make them confess all their sins or like whatever it is, but being a pastor is so interesting and so unique, and I think it relates to this calling that we all receive to carry the perfect love of God. Like when Victoria is talking about that is the greatest commandment, to love God. I don't know about you, but oftentimes I'm struck with how unperfect my love is. 
And then I'm reminded that we get to share that love with other people. And I'm like, God, I'm so scared that I'm going to mess it up. But he's with us. He goes before us. And even in our imperfections, even in our stumblings, even in when our best efforts don't quite make the cut, he's still with us. And he still moves through all of those things. And so when you look up here on this stage, I hope you don't see a couple people that did a bunch of really good things to be able to stand on this platform. I hope you see two people that have just yielded their lives to God. And that what we're going to do is we're going to all partner together and we will blaze the trail as we all follow Jesus together. And it's not about performance. It's not about like, like, it's about just yielding to God and discerning what the Spirit is up to together and following after that. And so I'm going to expand a little bit on um, this passage that we've read. And like Victoria mentioned, we were discussing how could we share in such a short amount of time the things that we care about the most, but we wanted to. And luckily, Jesus already did that for us. He outlined what the main thing really is. And this religious leader, he's trying to trap Jesus, and they're trying to get him to stumble up. And so in Jesus's answer, we learn that we love God. We we love because he loved first. This is the first and greatest commandment. And then he says the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. I think that statement begs us to ask the question, well, who's my neighbor? And elsewhere in Luke, there's a different religious leader also trying to trap Jesus. And he asks Jesus this exact question, who is my neighbor? And Jesus' response is a very famous parable that many of us know. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. And in this story, Jesus talks about a man who was on a journey who has been robbed and he has been beaten up and he has been left for dead on the side of the road. And Jesus is talking to a bunch of Israelites, and he's talking about all of these different religious leaders that they would look up to as highly esteemed people. And each of these religious leaders passes that man by and doesn't help him. And eventually, a Samaritan comes along, picks this guy up, helps dress his wounds. He puts him up in a hotel for a little bit. He takes care of this guy. And the Israelites, the people listening to Jesus, are shocked because the Samaritans are a group of people that were absolutely despised by the Israelites. The last person they would ever think could be the hero of a story. And Jesus asks them, so who was the most neighborly? And they have to say the Samaritans. So in this parable, Jesus breaks down all of our walls, and all of our preconceived notions of who our neighbor really is. In Jesus' command to love our neighbors as ourselves, he doesn't just mean the people that you live next to. He doesn't just mean your friends, and he doesn't just mean your family. In addition to loving all of those people, Jesus calls us to break down all walls, to break down all barriers, and extend love. The same degree of love that we would show ourselves to everyone we meet. And that's challenging. It's difficult. But it is the task laid before us. Because here's the thing, that's the kind of love that truly transforms people. That's the kind of love that transforms communities and cities. And that's the kind of love that lost people become found when they hear of this love. That even in their brokenness, even in their sins, even in all of their poor decision making, they are seen and they are known and they are loved. It's the love that each of us that calls us Christians responded to. And we're completely captivated and overcome by. Jesus concludes by saying all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So he just summarized the whole Bible for us. If you've ever wondered what it's all about. Love God and love people. That's what Jesus was about. That's what the Bible is about. That's what we're going to be about. And that's what we are going to be about. So it's our hope 
it's our prayer that you'll continue to partner with us. Um, we're going to continue to seek the Lord and discern how he wants us to do that in particular. We're just going to follow the spirit of God as he calls us. We believe that Jesus is still the hope of the world. That he is just as relevant today as he was when he was actually walking the earth. And we believe that God still uses people like us to share that love with those around us. Quite honestly, I can't think of anything better than that. So let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful that you loved us first. God, that you demonstrated perfect love to us. You didn't wait for us to get it all together, to try to have to earn it or, or be perfect in God. You never have that expectation of us, but God, you give us perfect love. Thank you, Jesus, for the way that you have helped us to understand what the main thing is, what you are all about. God, I pray for this community that as we seek to love the world around us, a world that is so desperate for a Savior. God, I thank you that, God, your heart breaks for those that don't yet know you. And so, Lord, as we enter this new season, we say we need you. We can't do it without you. We don't want to do it without you. And so, God, would you continue to pour your spirit out on this place? Continue to guide us, lead us, give us fresh vision, all of us together collectively as a community of priests. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that you would just fill every person here afresh with your Holy Spirit. I'm thankful, Lord, that you describe what we do as a body and that every part matters. Every part contributes to the health and the flourishing and the vitality of your kingdom. And so right now, would every individual in this room, those watching online, those who aren't with us today but are a part of this, God, would they know they are mobilized, they are filled with your Holy Spirit, that they are a part of this, that we would see, Jesus, your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven, that we would be witnesses to a move of your spirit, Lord, that we would steward it. Lord, would this be a place you long to dwell, that, you please, that you're pleased to dwell? that we would encounter you every week, but that, Lord, we would experience your presence with us as we go, that we would be the mobilized body of Christ. We thank you for this new chapter and this new season. We thank you for what you are going to do, God. We love you, Jesus. We love you. And we do this, and we gather, and we tell of who you are because we love you. Would you meet us over and over and over do what only you can do, Lord. Find us ready in your name. Amen.